Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done over 660 something of them now. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, uh, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. And you'll see something new under the past interviews menu. Um, we have a, a, a person develop this whole thing just in the past week and send it to me and say, look what I've done. And what it is, is a thing where you can type in any word or phrase and you'll immediately see a list of all the interviews in which that word or phrase was mentioned. And then if you click on any item in that list, you'll immediately see that video in the window up above. And if you click play on that video, it starts playing at the point where that word or phrase was mentioned. So it's a really cool search thing. Um, and it's based upon the YouTube uh, captions. And there are still about a third of the interviews or so that don't have captions yet. Uh, so we're in the process of creating captions for all those as well. In fact, if you'd like to help with that project, there's information on that page. In any case, uh, this whole program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website, and there's a page explaining alternatives to PayPal. Also, I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, looks like we are going to hit 100,000 subscribers this year, which has no ultimate significance, but it's kind of a cool mi milestone. So thanks for joining us, and uh, thanks to today's guest, who is Matt Garrett. Matt is a young fellow living in the UK. I discovered him through uh, his interview with uh, <clears throat> Angelo DeLulu, whom I interviewed a few months ago. And um, I've spent the last week listening to various um, YouTube videos that Matt has made and have enjoyed his burgeoning wisdom. <laughs> Um, so I have a brief in, uh, bio here that Matt sent me. I'll just read that and then we'll get started. Um, growing up, a burning desire to seek truth took hold. After years of searching, the need to see reality overtook the need to avoid suffering. Through the marriage of inquiry and surrender, realization unfolded in ways that could never have been imagined by my former self. After seeing through the illusion of separation, there is now a keen interest in exploring the mystery of reality and the human form. The stage of integrating this non-dual understanding into daily life is ongoing and beautiful and something I return to daily, not just to help myself, but to look for ways to alleviate suffering for anyone who is interested. It has been seen to be a never-ending clarification, deepening with each insight into reality a reality that favors authenticity, honesty, and devotion. All else will be burned to a beautiful pile of ash. So, if, it sounds dramatic when you read it out. Yeah, but <laughs> if, if nothing else, you're a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that's funny. It's funny because it's, it's so ordinary, but it's so, when you, when you want to write it down, it's like, um, yeah, it, it's, it's both extraordinary and ordinary at the same time for anyone. Yeah, that's very true. I, I often discuss that. I have, I have a friend who's going through a really beautiful unfolding, and she often finds herself just weeping uncontrollably with the overwhelming love and beauty she's experiencing and everything. And yet at the same time, you know, she she also uses the word ordinary. Um, mm. I mean, some people, go ahead, yeah. go ahead, what you're going to say? Just, just like she said, it's like the most ordinary, but for me, I think it's familiar is a word because it feels so like you always knew i think that's what the ordinariness why everyone says it um yeah yeah some people use the phrase the natural state to mm. refer you know uh, yeah. it's, it's perfectly natural um and yet i think that if if the average person who is deeply mired in suffering were to pop into it instantly their jaw would drop to the floor you know there would be this amazement and yet at the same time once you acclimate, and you, you've said things here about integrating and so on, once you acclimate, it's the most natural thing in the world. You don't walk around, you know, <laughs> weeping or <laughs> sit in a corner drooling or, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of natural. Yeah, it's, it's as if it's, it's, it's prior to everything, isn't it? It's, it's, it's what they're without the doing, without the, 
thought and it's there in the thoughts as well it's, it's, it, it, even to say like you said there it's, it's just prior to everything it's it's not as if it's waiting to be seen it's it's, it's once everything kind of just stops for a moment um it's just so it's just clear yeah, um, yeah. other phrases that are sometimes used are the, the simplest form of awareness um or the state of least excitation of consciousness you know everything else is a is an agitation but that natural state is just the most settled yeah. natural state so just closing the blinds slightly. Oh, that's okay yeah um yeah good, good. sorry so you you're only like 23 years old but yet you wrote this thing as if you've been on this long journey um <laughs> yeah. how old were you when you first got interested in this stuff yeah so that that's one thing i think is um like there's been a lot of suffering and it's weird i i, I know it's weird to uh, like i look young and stuff like that but i think maybe it just hit me earlier like very early i, I remember just an intense i look back and you can call it suffering but and with with almost a kind of sense of humor to it and um maybe a sense of oh that that was nothing i needed to do it but in in the moment it was excruciating it was um with the burning desire to know truth there was this need to get away from this suffering this feeling that this wasn't real this wasn't uh, normal this everyone else seemed normal and there was something that needed to be seen and even to this day wants to be clarified this it just i just couldn't live with with myself or the idea of myself that i thought i was and i knew there was a way out but then i realized this was going to be a way through if that makes sense and all my ways out basically dead ended which was just infuriating this sense of suffering this sense of isolation um and it was really through and i hold my hands up it's through teachers and things i've you know they've just i haven't done this i mean ultimately you see there's no one there's no real teacher there's no real guru they're, they're just showing it's already within but uh, coming across inquiry um you know just normalizing this unfolding that was happening gave me so much um courage to keep going with it that i just you know you you just start to be so grateful that you came across these things and you realize even gratefulness doesn't make sense but yeah burning does burning suffering was was the fuel for this <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think everyone as well really you said in this thing that you sent the need to see reality overtook the need to avoid suffering which implies that to see reality you had to confront suffering head on yeah had to sort of yeah. face it and not try to stifle it or blot it out yeah in fact I like you said that I go even further to the only way the only keys to the freedom was in the heart of this suffering was was at the core of each of these resistances these emotions if you want to call it on a relative level the things we were running from most i realized it wasn't that i had to overcome these things i had to just examine them for what they were and really allow truth to be seen rather than achieved by getting over it. and you know especially starting out with emotional work i realized and i've seen in your interviews it's amazing when people talk about emotion because i can relate so much to the only way i've ever gotten through emotion was to completely surrender to it go to the heart of it and die into it and it's just like surrender and inquiry just are the most magical things when when paired really and it kind of finds you in a way and um yeah di dying into it was something that really came about i think yeah it's interesting because the average person would look at you or would have looked at you several years ago when you started going through this and said you know what's this kid got to suffer about he's healthy he's well fed you know he's living in a warm house or whatever um but obviously you're talking about a completely internal thing mm. where the really the alienation from your true nature was causing suffering would it be fair to say that yeah you've you've hit I think you've really hit the nail on the head where you kind of dead end everything that I mean on one hand you can say I think every, a lot of people especially in the UK America like we've got the survival down to a T we've got food we've got a shelter I couldn't be more grateful for a happy childhood even to, to an extent it's almost as if that that added to this this inner fury this inner like everything that ended it couldn't be money that was going to provide happiness it couldn't be relationships it couldn't be all these things I was out of luck I was out of um anything so and then even spirituality became the last thing because spirituality enlightenment was this thing I can now chase that was 
you know, beyond the physical. And I could kind of turn my nose up at everyone else and say, look, they don't really get it. I get it. I'm onto enlightenment. Did you and do that for a while? The, then I got to the end of that as well. And that is that is the most um, horrible discovery to know that even the inner work was just another money or relationship or thing. And to an extent, I wouldn't say that's even bad. I think you have to chase spirituality. You have to chase enlightenment to really find that that really that is enlightenment but it's not what we think it's completely radically different it's just transcending who you even are so it, yeah it just dead-ended everything um including spirituality yeah and you know i mean you know that i don't know in the uk but when we were kids in the us we sometimes would play this game where you're trying to guess something and the person would say you're getting warmer or you're getting colder you know as you moved closer and closer to what what it was they were you were supposed to guess and uh you know i would say that spirituality even in the sense that you put it just now you're getting warmer you know it's not like drug <laughs> drug use or going yeah. to parties all night or anything like that you're you're on the right track but obviously there are degrees of maturity and the approach to spirituality yeah and, yeah you it, could say it, it's like it's like the upside down pyramid i always say with all these things you can choose from and you try and get closer and closer to truth and it's almost as if spirituality is getting to the root slightly more but then even in then if you open up spirituality you've got all these things which nothing wrong with them like mindfulness really helps um breath work astral projection all these things but if you want to get even closer to the core of that like what is the root of suffering like what what am i not looking at what am i avoiding and what can be inquired into or surrendered to and it's always a root. There's always the root, the self, the, the misident disidentification with a separate self, the belief in separation, just this simple belief um, triggers all of these branches of suffering that we can trim all day long with all these symptoms and, and plasters and or band-aids, whatever you call it in America. But like many people get, is, is completely sick of just healing this self. But then you turn around and try and find the one you're trying to heal and you're like, you can't find it. So, so there can be healing, but is there a person that's healed? Is there a self that's even progressing? Is there a solid entity that's even making any kind of progress? And this is what, in a way, it's paradoxical because you say there's nothing to do and, you know, spirituality is a um, waste of time or something, some people say. But really, if, you, if you're honest, there's an effortless effort that you can look in the right places to uproot the, the fuel behind this. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. It's like, okay, there's no self, but... Can you see that there's no self and does that drop away and is that seen with clarity and luminosity i think is what most people get stuck with is you can see through self for a glimpse but then all the mind identif identifications hits you like a train again and it's all there these conditionings and all this stuff yeah i'm glad you used the word paradox i've used that word so many times on this show that somebody once sent me a t-shirt that had the word paradox on it um <laughs> <laughs> there's so many things that are paradoxical in in this field um and there were like a dozen things in in the statement you just made that that are paradoxical or something is it's this but it's not this and it's also that you know and uh, we, we can dig into some of them um yeah. just really quickly because you said sure. something in the other day um you talk about a pendulum a lot between i think it was a video with Adi shanti or someone but it was so true with the pendulum on one hand sometimes when we break out of mind, we're so in, involved in this no self that this no self becomes, or this non separation becomes so amazing. But then the other shoe drops and it comes back to humanity, the human form, the relative level where we want to integrate, you know, where the emotions are, where all these things are. And people either get stuck sometimes up here because it's such an amazing experience, but that's what it is, an experience. And then it comes back, well, we are still in humans. There's a form here. There's a speaking between me and you. And it comes back this way, like you said. And then eventually it kind of goes back because it goes good. And then you can, you know, kind of walk this delicate line of seeing through self, but not disregarding your humanity. Yeah. I think that's the dance. It's, it, it's, it's, it's that, that kind of skill of getting in the middle. Yeah. Maybe that's where the Zen masters used to whack people with a stick, you know, someone yeah. would say, I am not the body. Okay. Whack. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, but when you're through Zoom, you can't really do that. So <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> there's a woman oh, named Jessica Nathanson, um, whom I'm going to interview next week. And um she has a website called The Glorious Both And. 
Um, and I first became aware of her because of a series of conversations she, she had with Tim Freak, if you know Tim. And um, I think he lives up in Glastonbury. He's been on Batgap a few times. But her whole thing was she had this awakening and then she dove into what we might call neo-advaita. And she she feels like it really dehumanized her and be, and disassociated her. And she just felt so it was in a bad place, you know. And so she's kind of on a campaign to promote integration and balance and living the paradox fully yeah it's it's there's there's so many traps um it's funny because i feel like the deeper you go the traps become almost more subtle but but deeper so like razor's edge yeah when you come back to the humanity thing then you can almost take on this i am a human a heroic trauma healer and and there's so much trauma to be healed but if you get stuck in just doing that and not and, and almost taking on the self again because the self wants to be this hero that is uh doing this for like humanity or doing it for themselves to be loved all the time and i don't know i think i think even there the self can operate in a way that's trying to progress with this stuff so in the middle it's like on one hand there's no solidity to me there's no kind of person here but at the same time there is conditioning there is a momentum of behaving in a way that's not aligned with that seeing of no self so it's like you say she she i really like that website title i'm gonna look at it after yeah, yeah there's that. a on the upcoming interviews page there's a link to her website um one of my favorite quotes was from the old buddhist sage padmasambhava he was said to have said um although my awareness is as vast as the sky my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour so in other words, you know, vast awareness and yet minute, precise attentiveness to the human value, to the to the relative value, to the act, to the behavior and so on. Yeah, that's that's it. It's I think Jeff Foster said um, you can honor the wave without turning your back to the ocean. Like, you know, you don't have to forget you're made of water. This is there, there, there is a skill. There's an art to it. It's like a dance. It really is a dance. It's it's a, it's. If you make it to science, it's all intellectual, it's all inquiry, it's all this, but there has to be a surrender at some point. There has to be a complete letting go of the raft. Um, and that's the scariest thing, this void that appears, or that was always there, but we're always running from, you know? Yeah. Um, Did you ever see Jeff's uh, cartoon, The Advaita Trap, on YouTube? No, I didn't, but I'd like it's, to see it. It's cute. Look it up. Um, it's basically these cartoon characters and it's based upon a, an experience Jeff had with his mother where they were walking in some park and his mother said, oh, look at the beautiful tree. And Jeff goes into this thing. Jeff, the cartoon character, goes into the thing. There is no beauty. There are no trees. You know? <laughs> okay. yeah. I remember he said that about his dad. He said something about the same with his dad. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. And, and there's no there's no warmth to it. There's no warmth to the teaching. It kind of seems a bit off. It seems a bit... Like there's definitely it's definitely so good like a whack on the head for just getting out of seeking but um it's like there's no warmth there's yeah it, it, it's strange it, but but at the same time you see why but all, all has to be done is to just notice who wants you know liberation more because it's just another identity on that side yeah i suppose how we we might be able to summarize what we've been talking about for the last few minutes is that um and spiritual development, if we want to call it that, there's many things we could call it, is a multi multi-dimensional undertaking. Um, you you can't sort of isolate yourself in one dimension of it to the exclusion of the others. There has to be this holistic, well-rounded, balanced development. Would would you agree with that terminology? Yeah. Um... I think it's down to like a spiritual maturity. I think yeah. um, I remember starting out and I was looking for a practice, a truth, a thing I could do enough of in order to achieve this plateau of enlightenment, this final ground of bliss and happiness. And everyone's going to like me. I'm going to have the best job in the world. And I'm going to be so spiritual that the books that I sell are going to go bestseller. I'm going to be the next Eckhart Tolle. We've all had it, okay? <laughs> and eventually, you have to mature enough to see that you have to die, really. Like, like you have to see this as a death in some ways, I think, because I was on the 
impression that I could achieve, 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 or see through self, become so enlightened. I remember walking through the forest, blissed out. I was blissed out. I had no sense of, well, the body was almost seemed to be completely empty of any solidity. It was as if I wasn't even really there. Like, I remember there's a tennis, you know, Djokovic, the tennis player. Oh, yeah, sure. Of course. He described it best, which is strange, that he was playing tennis, and at one moment he just felt he who he was this 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 person just it just wasn't there it was vacant but but life was but the aliveness was still there life was still going and i remember thinking this was it and but something deep down in me the seed knew and there's always been it's always been the case whenever something's come about it doesn't hang around for long these realizations because if you've got true authenticity true honesty you know that there's something more to look at there's something that's well who's experiencing this bliss Who's, who's the, who's the self that is it enlightened? Who's the self that is these things? And on the realization that you're everything or the realization that you're nothing, there's, there's always still a slight experience of that, a, a kind of progressive through that. And then the course took a very dark turn where, yeah, broken out of mind identification, everything that I thought I was, I, was, I saw through. But then all the momentum of the um, previous uh, conditionings, the karmic, um, all the conditions just came th- flying back because they wanted to be looked at. You know, it was a case of no stone being left unturned. There was uh, come back. It came back with more force. It came back with more uh, rage, anger, all these things. They had to be looked at now. There was nothing that could hide. It was like reality was forcing me to look at every single way that I was not being honest with my self-image, who I thought I was, you know, these constant, we're always bartering with life, trying to trade off with life, trying to, if I do this enough, I'll be more happy this day. And I had to really die into this process of, of, of of, almost it took a turn into, into no self rather than all self. And then the will, when the will starts dissolving, it's game over because no matter how much you try to, get back this will of I can do enough inquiry to meditate I can it's like surrender just floods your body like I I was never to credit for any of this and then it's like whatever you do now is not your will it's God's will Uh, there's no you (laughs) and and this is going somewhere that you can't guide and then you have you have no option but to like let go of the reins because if if you hold on to those reins again you will get the strongest burn in your hand you've ever had because you know you're not in control. It's like you're fighting your own illusion. And then eventually the, the lights are turned on so much. You see so much that you can't kid yourself anymore. You can't keep yourself asleep. You have to face every single trauma that, that was there, every single relationship issue, all this feelings of not being lovable or not being good enough or anger, all these things. It's It's brutal, but it's the most worthwhile thing that unfolds i think yeah maybe somebody who's listening right now could do us a favor and find that nisargadatta quote where he says something like you know when i see myself as everything then such and such but then when i see myself as nothing then such and such and between these two my life flows you know that quote yeah i think it's like with the love and then the wisdom and then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so let's see. Somebody could find that and send it in through the question form. That that'd be handy. Um, anyway, um, okay. So a couple of questions came in. Let, let, let me just ask those. And um, okay, this is a question from um, someone named Ajay Maharaj in Canada. In the bio um, that I read, it states that you were seeking to, seeking to find the truth and see through the illusion of separation. Can you speak on what that looked like for your close pers- personal relationships, including family? Yeah, so that could be split up into the seeking on one hand and then the seeing through separation on the other. Um, I, I'm not sure how it re- the seeking relates to family. If, if I think what what I get from that is the seeking, I think what there is, well as family as well as just the relative world, the seeking, I think it takes you out of kind of, I remember being almost disinterested in these personal relationships that used to be, of course, family's always there on a relative level, but there was this need to see through relationship at the same time, almost a retreat from relationship, a retreat from jobs, money, uh, I was in, uh, doing a degree, sports, all these things. There was a retreat from that. So the seeking could go inward because 
all of these people that I had relationships with, uh, or the career path, or the sport, or all these things, there was still a self that was doing that. And I'm not someone that thinks you have to be in a cave the whole time in, in this, but I, I do really think that a period of time of retreat in oneself is so beneficial because you can just let the noise just simmer for a bit let the silence sort of grow and and in that silence is what really you're needing to look at in isolation sometimes just just looking for this and i keep using this because it's like a you're you're no longer invested in i remember just being completely disinterested because i knew there's dead ends to all these things i'm not saying the dead end to family but people sometimes even i see it they hope to get a family and then they get the family and there's love there's all these things but there's still this agitation this need to find truth you know, not in a material good and these things. And there's still this looking for that self and the seeking really went inward with, I'd say, radical, radical inquiry. Um, this had to be known that there, there was, that I, I was a delivery driver for about a year and uh, was it three or four years ago now? Three, I, I can't remember, but I would take the inquiry home. Uh, it wasn't because I was forcing it, it because I was generally so interested that I couldn't find myself anywhere i couldn't find this person that was seeking i couldn't find matt i couldn't find when delivery driving out and about in the senses in the in the experience of self when talking to people when delivering food when using the physical body i could feel sensations but like where did i end where did the sensations start where when i was talking to someone when they were looking at when i was looking at their eyes was i looking at them or where are they located in the body so so the inquiry became so interwoven Everything became like that message, whatever came through, everything there. There was no distraction. So this could be done not just on the cushion, like I said, in the retreat. But then you started taking it into the world, this inquiry, this, you know, seeing the emptiness of objects. Like if I remember the en when emptiness came into my life in the, in, the, in the form of the insight of emptiness, you could see that there really was no objects, not just the emptiness of self, not just the emptiness of subject, but the emptiness of what I perceived. I remember doing it on my mum at one point. I was like, well, this sounds really horrible, but if I was to like really say, where is my mum? If I was to like tape off the arms, is she in the arms? <laughs> or Did you tell her arms? that? Or you just yeah, no, I was, I was just beheading her. <laughs> no, but I, had, I was trying to find where she was or anyone. Like, and then I thought, okay, she's behind the eyes. But then I was thinking like with myself, well, if I'm behind the eyes, let's go to the exact particle where I am. Like, let's really find this particle, this subject, this self that I keep referring to all day that I'm trying to protect, trying to make enlightened. And all I could find was empty sensations. There was just more sensations, kind of like a brain, where the brain seemed to be. And then even that I, I could be aware of prior to that. So I can't even remember what we're talking about, but, but yeah, yeah it, was, good. it was inquiry into, into, into self foremost. And in not finding the self, I think it opens up this, opportunity for lack of a better word to deepen the no self aspect um of, of that the, the, the dying into nothingness you know and anyway we're talking about the entity objects but yeah just I think it was rob burby if anyone's interested i just want to get anyone onto rob burby sadly he passed away but what, he, uh, what's that name rob burby how do you spell that so rob uh, r-o-b and then b-u-r-b-e-a he was a buddhist um a brilliant teacher down in devon i believe in he England. has videos on youtube he, he didn't he was like ramana maharshi in the way that he didn't want anyone to actually he didn't want video there's loads of audio tapes so if you just type it into google uh he is brilliant for emptiness he's got a book called um seeing that freeze if anyone's interested i would um he opened me up to the world of emptiness um and he had this thing where he said and this is what clicked emptiness for me. It's one day I sat in my chair and I was deep into contemplating what he meant. Because if, if I don't understand something, you have to kind of sit with it in a silence without, the, without an agenda to know. You just have, I just remember just sitting with it. And he said, we have objects, right? So let's say you have a, a mug like this. We, we see this mug as a solid object. He, he, took a, he took a chair and he said, he started burning the chair in this metaphor and he said when does the chair become not a chair into the pile of ashes you see how at one point it's a solid and then if you look at it later it's just rubble on the floor ashes so we have this kind of opens up this fragility of what we say is an object 
you know. Um, so I, I realized I could start doing this to everything, every object, like a car, for example. We say that's a Mercedes, that's an object, so I'm starting doing that. That's a BMW. But if you were to take the logo off the BMW, slowly start taking parts off, at what point does it not become a BMW car anymore when it's completely unrecognizable or, or, or something? So <clears throat> I could see the fragility of this world of perception of subject, object. And this was more just seeing the emptiness in objects before it was turned into an inquiry of the subject of these objects. Um, so yeah, that was a big shifting point, I think. Yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, people have been doing this for thousands of years. You can read the Mandukya Upanishad or the Ashtavakra Gita and books like that. And this is the way they talk, you know, that, I mean, they go so far as to say the universe never manifested in the first place. It's just a mistake of the intellect to perceive that it has and things like that. And modern physics, I mean, physics will tell you that if you boil everything down to a, a microscopic enough level, there's no physicality to be found. It's just probabilities and energies, <laughs> all that, all that stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, I've always been fascinated with the juxtaposition of spirituality and modern science, particularly physics. And a lot of people are interested in that. Um, because, you know, through these modern tools, we're finding that these ancient wisdom teachings are true and they just had a different way of going about it um one thing you said i wanted to ask you about i also heard about this and you you alluded to it in the last few minutes but i also listened to it in some of your audio your your youtube videos um you know how we were talking earlier about integration and balance and holistic development and all that there there are some of the things you've said which to my mind leaned a little heavily on sort of the not having ambition or initiative or motivation and, and stuff like that and I, I think that those things can be balanced with detachment and with surrender um like at the time you were interviewed by angelo you were working in a clothing store and you were like either on the door or on the cash register and i thought well this guy has so many so many good uh He's a, he's a smart guy, so much potential. He can do more than that with his life. So if, if, if you were to be satisfied with that as your life, I don't know. I, I, I kind of see spiritual development as a full blossoming, blossoming of our potentialities. And I think that a lot of the great scientists and composers and writers and people like that were actually highly evolved people and they had unlocked certain potentials that they expressed through their art or their science and um i i don't think there's any um reason why an enlightened person couldn't also be a great musician or scientist or or something like that he doesn't just have to work in a in a dumb job <laughs> you know no, what i mean I, yeah before i go into the, the striving so i think striving is probably one of the best traits you can have for spiritual awakening. I think it, if you're striving inward, if, if you're striving to be open, vulnerable, curious in reality, you've got everything you need to go the whole way. Which you if were doing. I mean, you weren't just sort of ho-hum, <laughs> I guess I'll just drive this delivery truck. I mean, you were, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. uh, inquiry so, so the whole time. I think that's why I keep my private life quite separate because the what I'm doing in my actual job, which isn't cl clothing store, it's, it's funny, I, I love the clothing store job because there's so much interaction. There's so much ways that someone can pull you out into your shadow and express this. I mean, working a clothing store in Oxford Street, you're going to be at your wits end on rage at times. The amount on Black Friday, I remember just thinking, this is the best. If anyone's become enlightened, get a job at Urban Outfits on Oxford Street and work Black Friday weekends. And it's like, it's like Ram Dass when he said, go spend a week with your family. It's the same right, thing. Right, right. So, so the clothing shop, was a practicality for me to move to London in the midst of a um a pandemic. Yeah, it was it was rent through the roof. And so my actual job is in documentary filmmaking and um making adverts for like commercial work. Um, so you have you have that job now. Yeah, yeah. And 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 as you said there, every single when when you can go into creative, I, I, I like to keep it separate, this whole thing, this, but I could talk about it anyway now because I think it might help people that are also into the creative world. Everything I've ever made now, the freedom you get in art without having to take credit for it, without having to feel like you're doing it, you're the doer of it, 
also not being bound by limitation in what can be created. I think the only reason that I've managed to carve a career in my filmmaking is because I, because of this unfolding. And you, and now I realize I've never made anything. It's just happened through me, just like this podcast for you happened through you. It's a beautiful podcast and you've just opened the channel for this, whatever your being is. And sometimes it feels like, oh, this is difficult. I don't want to give up my credit for this. But in giving up the credit for the artwork and giving up the doership, it just flows. It flows and it flows. And people hone in on it. The best music I've ever seen, um, like Djokovic, when he's playing tennis, he doesn't even feel like he's there. This is why he's so good. Yeah. At yeah. Times. And you look at David Bowie or Michael Jackson. Um, he, Michael Jackson said, I know there's a lot of controversy with him, but Michael Jackson once said, I mean, let's say, let's be honest, he's one of the most influential people in music, most popular with his with his music. And he said at one point, something along the lines of it was just him dancing in the moon and, and he disappeared. Or again, like Djokovic, this, this no self is creeping into the people at the top of art world or, or music or these things. It's like they're tapping into non-duality and expressing it through them or it's using them to express. And people around the world can, something deep in them knows that. And that's why they're so successful, I feel. Yeah. And somebody like Djokovic, I mean, if you have a serve coming at you at 130 miles an hour and the whole game, is, you can't actually, it, it, you have to be on autopilot, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, of course, you have to have a lot of training and you have to have the right physiology and everything. But the greatest athletes often speak of this kind of experience where they're just in this deep, you know, kind of witnessing state and and things are just happening automatically. Yeah. No, I think tennis is such a good one because you this, even if you weren't into non and you didn't have the experiences, you're not really there anyway. In a way, it's all the training's already been done and there's there's no room for any kind of thinking, oh, it's 180 miles this way, I need to... No, you're... you're <laughs> in a, whereas if it's something like darts where you're kind of in your head and you're right. thinking and you're thinking and you're thinking, or pool or snooker or whatever, it's, um, it's so different. Um, but you started to touch on striving, which I think is really good. And... And I think the same thing, where if someone is taking this message as, oh, there's nothing really to do. This is all play. I can just go and drink a beer. Like that, that's aversion to me. That, that's avoidance to me. Because one thing that Angelo taught me, uh, and I think Angelo is one of my most powerful teachers in his ability to point without giving you candy for the mind. And he said, um, he said one of the best, he commented on something, something the other day. He said, the best practice really for awakening is a life well lived. Like if you live your life well and thoroughly, first of all, your life kind of gives way. There's, there's no, the you gives way. And, but what, what he means by this, I think, is that if you, if you lean into life, you get, get everything out of the shadows, face everything with honesty and brutal, brutal authenticity, you will wake up because the aversion kind of seeps away and like you said the need to wake up kind of overtakes the need to be comfortable the need to because let's be honest people look at people who are young or something but we've had lifetimes of suffering i think we're just sick of it the people that are into this path and they just want to go the full way now they want to wake up now and, and the sad thing is i see so many people into this stuff but they get sidetracked into like i'm not saying any of these are bad but like certain practices that want the self and, and keep hold of the self and they don't just want to sit in an empty quiet room and face a brick blank wall and just let all the suffering come up and all the pain come up and just to surrender to that because that is the best practice as well it's just it's just silence basically i think yeah so there's a couple of points here that i want to unpack more with you one one is uh, the striving point and another is uh the the doership point and a question came in on the doership point um from charlie melk m-e-l-k in wapaka wisconsin um this is the age-old question he said does free will exist and if so what is its role in awakening i've never heard a good explanation of the relationship between free will and determinism or at least one i could learn from and apply to my own spiritual development hmm. yeah so let's keep this as non-intellectual as we can, but still attack it in a way that hopefully sheds light. Because the first thing I'd say is once we, we think about things, what, what we try and do with, with thought really is avoidance of what's here and right now. So anything that's here right now, especially free will, we can investigate anything. Let's get out of philosophical debates, not this person, but 
philosophical debates about free will determinism, the only way we are going to ever look into this is right here, right now, in this moment, um, in experience, in the sensations, in the, you know, we have to go prior to thought. Because if we, if we try and figure out thought with thought, we're just a dog chasing its tail. So these things like free will, I would say investigate First of all, on a relative level, there has you know to be able to hold people accountable for bumping into your car or killing your dog. <laughs> you know, there's going to be free will there. I, I'm not saying that that, but in my experience, when I investigated free will, I could never find this will, this personal will that I supposedly had. And I would say, can you even find where you first made a decision? Can you find not only can you find the one that's making the decision, but can you find these decisions? Because if you even look into the science aspect, this is still an investigation of now. You, you know the whole experiment where the thoughts were firing the neurons like 10 seconds before it even fired. And so this kind of inquiry can lead you to a place of total exertion where it really does feel like if you trace everything back to the Big Bang, it's almost as if everything is just kind of, the conditions are here for something to happen. Even me to come onto this call with you, your neurons fired to watch Angelo's thing, something in you, wanted Angelo, Angelo made a video once that this is all God's will. This is that I can't find this separate self that's doing this. I can't find all of this. So, and that's, there's so much freedom in that if you don't take it in a way of attachment or inversion, because people take this and then they'll go and sit on the sofa and say, there's no free will. I've been doing what I want, but that's them resisting that insight and not facing what that truly means, which is no, now you have no free will over your suffering. And when you give up free will and suffering, it has full reign to show itself, flower itself, and be processed or, or seen through. I think it's another one of those multidimensional paradox things. Um, I like take the Bhagavad Gita, for instance. There are verses such as, you have control over action alone, never over its fruits, you know. Um, live not for the fruits of action, nor attach yourself to inaction. So there are these verses where Lord Krishna is saying to Arjuna, do something. Here's what I want you to do. Take initiative. And then there are other verses where it says, like, you know, you are not the doer. And the, the, the enlightened person realizes I do not act at all. And everything is, you know, the will of God or whatever that, that's carrying it on. So why would why would he state two completely contradictory things in one in one book? And I think the reason is that um, you know, knowledge is different in different states of consciousness at different levels of consciousness um different levels of spiritual maturity and you have to be you can't appropriate the truth of one level to a level that you're not you 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 yourself are not living um so you have to if you experience yourself as having volition then you have to exercise it wisely if you experience if it's your experience that everything is really the will of god then you know no problem it'll you'll <laughs> it'll all carry on automatically and you know when people do this kind of misappropriation they get themselves into trouble um there was recently a teacher who was embroiled in a scandal where he was you know sleeping with a lot of young women who were coming to him as students and uh in spite of the fact that he was married and so on and when he, when that was discovered he started coming out with all these excuses like oh i am not the doer or it's just god doing it it's the will of god and all this stuff so you know it's just um kind of a bs misapplication of a beautiful teaching and um so I think, you know, the, the whole free will determinism thing, maybe ultimately there's absolutely no free will. But if we experience ourselves as having it, then don't use an intellectual concept of there being no free will as uh, a kind of a tool in, in your daily life. Just be who you are, where you are, and be genuine. Uh, otherwise, it can cause confusion and get you into trouble. Yeah, no, you've hit the nail on the head because if if someone's going to be brutally honest, if someone ever says to me, look, my, my, self, my sense of self has fallen away completely, it's never returned. That, to me, there needs to be a fragrance of self because if someone's to call your name and you don't turn around, then that is, that's dropped away, you know? Exactly. This, this is the expectation people have. They're like, enlightenment, you know, you, you blissed out. You do, no, you just see through the reality of that ego. You don't lose the, the, the ability to speak 
the ability to turn the even when I'm driving my car and I hit someone or not that I have ever, but let's say I hit let's <laughs> That's say why I you lost your car. delivery driver job, right? <laughs> you had to get into a clothing <laughs> in the shoot after that. Um, <laughs> but like you say, let's say I was to deliver someone and I and I would uh, I dropped all their shopping or or I on purpose or, or whatever by accident hit them. In, in this moment, you have to admit on the relative level to the character. Yeah, you could I, say I screwed well. up. Yeah, I, I screwed up. It wasn't you. It was. But this is the dimensional thing. How do, how might how dimensional? How deep do we want to go into this? How prior do we want to go to this? Beyond all of this, because if you were to take it out, you can look at even the two of you arguing, and you're beyond the two arguments. The will of this person, will of that person. So it's like, but in the moment, I don't think it's the best thing to be in that state of absolutist no self. Because if your child had just fallen over or you know, an old lady needed help. If I went into no self absolutist, I need to go into my character as the human to be able to help help her across the road in my form. Like we just swing the pendulum all day. Yeah, yeah. Until, until we walk that line. Um, and there was something you said that I really want to touch on because it was good. Yeah, this whole will. I think if you're if you're premature to some of these teachings, especially emptiness, especially will, you take it. The mind takes it as oh. I can use this to make myself more comfortable, or happy. I can I can now say it's fine to t play video games all day or be hor horrible to my mum or or dad because there's no free will. Like Jeff Foster said, with the beauty of the tree, that there's no beauty, there's no tree. But this is this is just not true or, or not close to close to truth. Um, I say what's close to the truth is when you've really exhausted the will, even desire. The, I remember someone said the other day they said, quite fun. I hope this is all fine talking this kind of thing. They said I had the desire to go meet a prostitute and i said i didn't i didn't i would never say what to do i just said in, a, in another case though when desire is there the prostitute is not a good example but if there's a desire there you need to not suppress it feel it inquire into it the one that's doing it the one because when we suppress the desires you just have another form of resistance another form of shame guilt all these things and th this doesn't help at all um but but with the will back to the will yeah if you go to the edge of the will and you and you see that you hit the ceiling, I love when Adi Shanti said, you really do hit the ceiling of what you can do because at a certain point, inquiry even loses its um, ability to see through things, even emotional work. It's like you're out on a raft to sea, I was saying. Eventually, all these things have gotten you out to the middle of the ocean, but the truth is at the bottom. You have to let go of the raft and like sink without practice, without your own will, without any kind of knowledge or way through i feel and that could be taken on different levels but and it only really flowers sometimes when it's needed but all these practices and things are so powerful i feel they just sometimes need to be let go of, and that includes the will yeah uh, two thoughts on what you just said one about the desires um we don't just act on any desire that happens to pop into our heads. I don't care what state you're in. Um, there's a value to discernment, you know, discrimination. Um, and there's a value, you, you might be tempted to, let's say you're working in the clothing store and um, some customer was being impatient and gnarly with you. Um, you know, you might have a an impulse to say something to tell them off, but, you know, you can check that desire. You're not going to cause irreparable frustration harm to yourself or anything is just a, there's a wisdom to being able to hold one's tongue or to check one's impulses if they're inappropriate um the second thing is about the pendulum thing um it's not it's never all or nothing you know um a pendulum gives the impression like it's gonna it's way over here but it's not going to be over here what i'm i'm kind of suggesting that it's more like a zoom lens on a camera and you're you're a camera guy uh where you know you you might focus in on a particular thing but you also still see the background like right my my image right now is focused on me but you can st still see the background and maybe you zoom to the background and i become blurry um but in any case our our focus there's always going to if if we're really developed uh in this way there might there's always going to be the sort of no self silence non-doing dimension and there's going to be the kind of divine everything is perfect just as it is dimension and there's going to be the oh we have problems here this child just fell down or is, is about to run in front of a car or something like that dimension and you, you you don't you don't ever 
focus ex exclusively on one to the exclusion of the others. That it's just more of a matter of the zoom lens going to where what's appropriate at that time. Yeah, you, I think I'll never use the pendulum again now because this is such a good this this thing that you talked about. Because, like you say, when when you when you what all this is really is a stepping back, a widening of the lens. And when you when you're what I like about that is when you're in the humanity thing, it does feel like a getting closer. It does feel like a leaning in. Sometimes when it's emotional work, I just say just lean into it. Just until there's no you and it, you're, we're, we're almost going in and in and in. Uh, it almost like an, a tantric approach to that and and the going back and back and back and back i'd also say as well like you say it's less like that way or this way or even zoomed in and zoomed out there's almost a case of you can stay in the silence even even in the noise of becoming a, or taking the form of a human you you start to never forget the silence yeah you have no choice after a while exactly you, you <laughs> if, exactly so if someone sat there and they were really mind identified it's almost as if it takes more effort to be in the silence and eventually being the silence you see is your natural is your state anyway and it takes more effort to suffer more effort to have to think and to create these illusions and kid yourself again that that there's anything wrong that the the, the the separation is has any reality to it yeah in fact i think it was angelo when i was listening to your interview with angelo he was saying that for him um the more heck the more crazy the situation and i think he's an he's an emergency room doctor isn't he the, the more crazy the situation the more he notices the silence because the contrast is greater or something. Yeah. Um, I remember he said that. Um, and it, it gave the same thing of, oh, this can be done anywhere. This can be seen anywhere. And there's times where I was um, in the silence and my, my mind, was the, mind was the most noisy at that point. So it's, it's that same thing again. Um, and it, it just shows people if Angelo can do it, it with the stress of his job, I have nothing to say about anything in my life. That can ever and, and, and unless I was suddenly amputated with everything and I was this and I had no prospects or anything, he has the most stuff on his plate up until that point. Um, in terms of professional jobs, I think you know having something like that and to be able to still do that has given. I've, I know other people who are doctors and they've read and seen Andrew stuff and had so much courage to do their stuff because before it was just an excuse. They didn't have time. We didn't have a thing. Even delivery driving, I would have probably said before. This is you know we're not doing it. 12, 10 hours a day like there's no time to sit and meditate okay i'll take the meditation to the delivery drop van driving i'll take it to the conversations i'll take it to going to the toilet where do i end and where does the toilet start this kind of <laughs> this kind of stuff you know that that i want to take this back to striving because i remember one of the things i wanted to really talk about today was that this can be done by anyone and yes relative world there are going to be problems where you know, you've got, to, you've got to do a job or maybe your degree is taking over. But eventually, if you're really wanting this and more than you want something in the land of careers or money, and you don't have to just cut them down, but you can incorporate this and orient towards this until this is your priority. And you don't forget anything else. You just orient towards this whilst doing these things. or And you can go the full way. Anyone can. Yeah. There's a principle we might call the highest first. In other words you don't eliminate all other things, but you prioritize. And so, you know, this is your first priority. And then, and as Jesus said, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee. So you don't lose everything else. You actually gain more if, if this inner development or whatever we want to call it is your highest priority. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so resonate with that. Um, I, th I think what, what came to mind when you were saying there as well is the realization of the amount of suffering it took to try and put happiness in these other things like careers and these things. It doesn't mean, trust me, post awakening, I've been even more involved in filmmaking because there's no agenda to use it for happiness. Because there's no agenda, it opens up this complete freedom to create and do stuff and still make a living out of it. And when there's no agenda, because you look, I, I, I was talking to another guy the other day, he's a musician. Before the awakening, he was making music in order to, um, I'll say his name as well, Yihan Jihan, I think his name was. I just want to put his name out there because he's a, such a lovely guy. Um, he was making music before and it was almost like an agenda. He had to make something in order. Post awakening, you see that there's nothing in that substance wise that's going to bring happiness. There's no fulfillment there. And suddenly you're free in the realm of music to create with no need to if there's money involved, of course, it becomes tricky, but it just opens up this freedom um, to create without 
sustaining, a, I don't know, some hope that this is going to fill me up. Yeah. And I don't know how we want to define happiness, but I wouldn't say that it brings no happiness, but it's more like icing on the cake. You know, um, I'm sure that this fellow derives fulfillment and, uh, by creating his music and it's, it's a joy to him. He'd rather be doing that than just sitting, staring at a wall or something. Um, but he probably would also be content just staring at a wall, but, you know, but so it's like a, a value. It's an add on, you know, you, you get to have the fulfillment and do something that is, is uh, a joy and perhaps is a benefit to other people. It, it goes from exactly that from this will find me happy. This will find me wholeness, this thing to this thing is just a celebration of the wholeness. Yeah. This thing, like relationships. I remember thinking at one point, because relationships for me, especially intimate relationships, have, was such a hotbed of resistances and suffering, and there's so much validation and security and within into this. There's so much there to be deepened with self, because that's why I think the self operates so much as well. Um, what are we talking about then? Um, Add, added on fulfillment in addition to yeah. the baseline fulfillment. Exactly, and you can sense when someone just energy wise want something from you in the room or something or some kind of validation even relationship because they're thinking this person will fulfill me will fill me up will will add to this wholeness to me but then if you've ever sat with someone i don't know if you have where they just feel really content in themselves they they don't really want anything from me but oh yeah if I say what's the difference between these two people i'd say this person feels the fullness feels complete and the laughter, the, the things you share are a celebration of that wholeness. Whereas anyone else usually is looking as with an agenda to either manipulate you, to get them to like you or to attach to them. Or it's just slight perspective change that happens, not through force, but through a seeing that there is no, there's no separation. There cannot be no, anything to attain, to lose um, in this case. Oh, yeah. um, you know that phrase from the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. Um, I'm not a big Bible expert or anything but I, my grandmother used to read that to me when i was a kid and uh I, I think of that often because it's like when my cup runneth over when you're when you are full within yourself then you naturally overflow and um if you're not then you can't really overflow uh, in the sense of the kind of person you just referred to that who is content with themselves and you feel the the overflow come <laughs> in when you're in their presence so um yeah, i think that the more deeply awake one is the more one's personality blossoms it's not like you become more a bland emotionless person but you become more vibrant more alive more you know and um and the more it benefits others and just one more thought before i lose it which is that uh you know that saying man is made in the image of god when you were talking about um the value of the sort of fullness rising in waves and the, the joy of creating this and doing that. Um, you know, maybe that's even if we're made in the image of God, maybe our that thing you described is a reflection of what God Himself is doing. Because you know, you can imagine prior to the manifestation of the universe, there's just sort of the God in resting pose, as it were, you know, just flat oneness and then i am one may become many it rises up in waves and there's a value added there's a, some joy in the whole show you know the whole creation that is more than just the unmanifest value by itself mm, yeah you move from you you move from wholeness you like, when you were talking now i remember something that someone said to me it's like what like, like how how is it different what what is it different and when you're when you're not moving from this as if god's moving through you, as if you're if you're putting in this effort constantly to take credit for your actions and this doership and this this thing this energy that all the energy it sucks out of all the blame and guilt and effort striving with these things you're missing out on the truth reality of it really is just god's will moving through yeah through you. and and the beauty and the joy that you're talking about there it's almost as if beauty and joy is synonymous with with this seeing um because it's what's what's the difference as well Let, let's investigate this as well like how can people see into it i think it's the word is resistance as well because when you're resisting you're basically saying you're going against the universe you're saying god is you don't trust god you don't trust the universe in this moment because you'd be saying no i know best here i shouldn't have this feeling i shouldn't have this thought i shouldn't have the you're going against billions of years of evolution to get to this state all this 
the amount of naivety I had, or most humans have, to say that this moment is wrong, is is basically saying you know best over God. But then once you really let God show, and I don't want to keep using the word God, let's call it universe because it puts people off. I've found. Well, let's just define it quickly. We, we let's call God, if we're going to use that word, just the sort of all pervading intelligence which is running the show from the subatomic to the galactic level. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we could exactly. And I, I am going to keep using the word universe now just because I've that's seen okay. it. But, but that's a perfect description. Um, but when you're going against the universe, it's it's so there's so much suffering in that because when you go with the universe there's no use to, anymore to do it there's just this aliveness it's like the weather patterns they, they just come together and you know this this body's temporary but what it sees through my eyes and sees through your eyes is exactly the same and it's beyond all of that you know we're just playing a game at this moment i'm just so when someone says you know i look i look at you now and i see myself beyond your form and and my form that they're they're, they're that is the absolutist view and you can fall into that this beauty of it and what the piece i think comes is this lack of this seeing through doership because when you see through doership you realize there's not a single thing there's no space for anything to be out of place if yeah. there's no there's no gaps where things could oh that could have slightly gone wrong there i shouldn't have, every single thing that's ever happened prior in, in my life showed me an aspect of reality that i wasn't looking at all these wrong things the suffering things all these things and when you really see that now, anything that comes to you in the, in the future is now more of an opportunity to deepen. There's something I'm not quite looking at here. And there's nothing wrong. The universe is just about timed it right. You said something earlier there where you said, you know, some people shouldn't be opened up to all of this straight away. They, their body minds couldn't handle it. But the universe will just give you little pieces until, you know, Ramana Maharshi, he had it, bam, his, his the apple was ripe to drop whenever he was but then he was in this state of he was having rats eat away or something yeah he, yeah he was legs are being gnawed on by insects and and then he got out of that pit and the, he went up on the mountain and sat in a cave for many years before he was whatever he needed to be to come and start interacting with people exactly so who are we to say that this is not right even in your life my life the universe is literally giving us pieces that are just right for us to open and widen our our view of who we are who what reality is what's uh, what's true and if i was to give you know if someone's come across a teaching that would blow their world open they might just implode i don't know if someone's so mind identified the universe is the most intelligent is intelligence it, it knows what it's doing yeah that's great the way I one analogy I use these days, which seems to fit for my life, is that it's as if we're in this play, and there is a script to the play. There's a there's a script writer who wrote the play, but we also have the um, permission to improvise, and so we're kind of going along, and things happen. Okay, that's part of the script, but I think I'll improvise this way, you know, and uh, maybe that's just a halfway kind of developmental state because maybe if I were cosmic enough, it would be just you know. I totally go with the flow and everything is fine. But that's that's my orientation that there's um it's kind of like that I've said this many times before, but it's like the nursery rhyme, row, row, row your boat, where mainly the stream is carrying the boat along, but you are you still have a paddle and you can row and but you're rowing gently down the stream. So there's just little minor adjustments you make as you go along to maybe avoid this rock or exactly. whatever. Exactly. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the preferences are, can still be there, but there's just the seeing the emptiness of these preferences, the seeing that there's no one there deciding, there's there's no credit for, for this or that. Because to be honest, if you were to drop the whole notion of preference and you wouldn't be able to choose what to eat, you would you right. would wear. So the character, the character is still there. It's it just it just even even those preferences are completely not your doing. No, no, but no, there may no. still be the perception that they are. You go to a restaurant, let's say, and you look at the menu and you, you ponder it for a while and you think, okay, well, you know, this one looks like it might be good. I think I'll try that. And, you know, so maybe that's just automatic and you didn't have any choice in the matter. But if you if you perceive that you do, don't beat yourself up over it. It's just you know, it's, it's natural. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I think I think the one thing I do want people to really know, and I think I remember just thinking, I just want anyone out there to know that this can this can be done if if you orient towards it. If if you if you want to go the full way, or if you want to see through through self, if I can just give a bit of context, 
because I feel like I remember listening to Andrew and realizing how dedicated he was, how, and even that's a paradox because, because the, the dedication that he removes. But if you sit with this inquiry and you, and you really hold space, I think is the right word. Because if you're holding space for this surrender to unfold, if you try to do this, if you try to surrender it, it's almost there's still an agenda woven into this. There's still a need to get somewhere else to progress into this. But if you, you know, every night, if you have or every morning in the day, if you have a keen interest to go the full way and you orient towards this, everything that you think you're running from with these things, if you just sit with it and instead of trying to practice out of it, you go to the root of why it's even there, the fuel behind it, the the self in the middle of all it, it drops out. The, the, the bottom of self drops out and the suffering there, it struggles to grow back without the fuel, the fuel of separation, the fuel of belief, the fuel of resistance. This is the thing I really wanted to hammer home because I remember sat there not thinking this was, do, I thought this was for the Eckhart Tolls of the world, the Ramana Maharshis, the, even the Adishanti. But then I came across Adishanti and he was one of the first guys. He seemed like a normal, really normal guy. And he took the sport to the edge. He took cycling so far to the edge. And this pursuit, this striving you said, touched on, the striving you need. You need to exhaust seeking into the ground to finally say, I don't know what I'm doing. God or universe, show me, re reveal it to me. And it reveals as soon as you stop looking for it. And that's kind of what happened to Ajit too. I mean, he, he also, he, he, he just holds, has this competitive spirit. So when he got into Zen, he was like, all right, I'm going to do this to the max. And, you know, he would go on these long retreats and just, you know, meditate like crazy and everything. And he finally reached a point where he, he, he thought he was going to snap and he he left in the middle of a retreat and went home and he had this little meditation hut in his parents' backyard. And he just went in there and he said, I give up, you know, that's it. And boom, and then he had his big awakening. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, how true is that? How true is that? Any insight that ever really come about in my experience anyway, is sometimes I'm just staring out to see, or if I'm just, just sat because, because in that moment, I think the groundwork could be put in the inquiry, the exhaustion, but then it kind of just flowers when you're least expecting it because that's when the will kind of takes a break for a second. That's when the agenda, the pursuit kind of bottoms out for a bit. Um, yeah. But Adja might tell you and probably would that he don't think he wouldn't have had that awakening if he hadn't done all that striving. Yeah. Same, same. I think that I think a lot of people exhaust themselves and in the exhaustion, they finally stop and not a stop like physicality stop, but they stop beyond the physicality they just they just give up looking for something and they just allow the universe to show them they hold space for something to unfold because they the resistance to when, whenever you're seeking you're resisting now you're saying there's something here that needs to change when you give up seeking you're almost giving fertile ground for like the flower to bloom whatever you want to call it poetically but it there's a there's a there's a stopping that takes place and in the stopping you see the silence that was always there you see you just it unfolds and you you wonder why you were ever so caught up in all of these thoughts yeah you never you never looked at the silence between the thoughts and and yeah it's always this, there it's, this whole yeah. thing of giving up seeking it's kind of a popular phrase these days papaji once said to a group of people sitting with him give up the search and there are conferences about the end of seeking and websites about it and everything and um i don't know my orientation to it and feel free to disagree or comment on it is that it's a there's a phase obviously where you you're just not feeling much fulfillment and so there's a kind of a desperation oh man i gotta get this i gotta realize this and but then there's a time when the fulfillment really has matured quite a bit and there's there's a sanskrit word santosh which means contentment so there's a contentment quality that grows but you don't necessarily you know rest on your laurels at that point there's still this enthusiasm and motivation and curiosity and uh, realization that there's so much more to deepen and to know and to integrate and so on but it's done more on the basis of uh, a fulfillment quality rather than a, a desperate emptiness quality well this is the taboo i think that you've talked on where seeking can end and i i found the seeking end and now I'd call it clarifying or I call it because in a way there was so in uh, post awakening, I'd say the intensity of suffering, if you want to call it suffering, maybe less of the word suffering. Cause that, it, there's less, there was no personal suffering, but suffering 
it made me face everything. And even though the seeking had stopped, I think it's because the seeking had stopped, I now couldn't numb myself with thinking my way out. I had to face it all full on. And like you say, the enthusiasm, yeah, all the positive stuff, but there's a clarifying which of death, which is like a post awakening where there's a big taboo where, you know, I don't even mean for these videos that I post to kind of gain traction. I think eventually I will just stop at some point and just, and just rest in, and, and do the video stuff. But so this just taken away from the fact that I didn't want this to really come about, but it's all God's will, whatever you want to call it. But what was it about the post awakening? This, the seeking can stop, like you say, but that, doesn't mean really that this has deepened to its fullest depths because I, I think I think not many people have gone when say people not many beings have have a, have allowed the personal will the the death the there's a there's a lady it's you did an interview with um Adyashanti, is it Suzanne Marie uh, Susanna Marie yeah yeah Those, well, she and Adyashanti and I had this conversation yeah. yeah I love that because they touched on something that I couldn't really see much online which was this the the no self the real the, the real sense of even the center the the one that's experiencing this like people can stop seeking because they see they're everything but now let even that experience of bliss let the experience of enlightenment really die into nothingness because uh, because some people still take credit for even the inquiry up until that and that shows that there's still a residual will there so it's almost like this it's like this big grand thing and you go on youtube and you sell your insights then everything comes crashing back because you now need to in you need to embody this realization you need to breathe it live it you know how you converse with people how you like these hooks let's put our hands up people that unless you all your conditioning falls away i think i was quite lucky and still am that things hit me with an event with, with a, such an vengeance afterwards because i thought i was in the clear I, i'd broken out of mind identification it's almost if i woke on the level of mind and this hadn't caught up this was still operating on the old system and it needed to be and it's, this is the funniest thing you can't go around it you have to go through it each time it's like the animals come running at you and you just get trampled and the only way you can do it is really face whatever's running at you and see what they're trying to tell you because every every single trauma that comes up every single bit of suffering that comes up to me i can speak from experience was something that i wasn't looking at in reality either my self image maybe it was something i was denying maybe i didn't feel good enough but i tried to be a better filmmaker in order to put up with that validation in how i looked maybe all of these things you have to let die and like you said the seeking stops but i feel like the clarifying is where it's brutal i think you because you if you want to go the full way reality is looking at you like this and you have to face each of your resistances each of your things until there's no stone left and turn and then that to me is the start of embodiment because it's not that you're now blissed out and happy you just you lose the ability to resist which doesn't mean doesn't truth doesn't care about happiness this is aliveness this is how this is the realization you know this is the end of chasing happiness this is the start of seeing truth through this integration um, and even integration loses its term because it implies it never was integrated it's just like you say these depths of awakening and i think i the only people that really resonate even at this stage for me were because i don't do much looking online but definitely adishanti definitely angelo uh suzanne marie um they're the people i really uh, recommend to others if they feel this urge is resonation to go beyond awakening like i think uh, adishanti's got a video even called beyond awakening or something but the one that i really like is one that he's called i think it's on his website for anyone it's called beyond the personal world and only watch it if you're resonating with it because it can really take you to places maybe you don't want to go <laughs> but i think everyone's going that way anyway yeah check out harry alto sometime you ever watch any of my interviews with harry what's it how do you spell his surname h well firstly his first name is spelled differently it's h a r r i because he's finnish and alto a a l t o um and you'll find that there's a index on the, the past interviews menu of bad gap where you can just pop that name and you'll come up anyway different take than most people on on all this stuff i won't elaborate i'll let you just check it out so a few more questions have come in here let's see here's one from somebody in your neighborhood darren emerson in jersey uk um, as part of your awakening have you lost contact with friends and family because they no longer get you 
or you get them? Um, if so, how have you reconciled it with yourself? Personally, I've found this a source of sadness, so I'm interested in your view. So yeah, that's it's a beautiful question because it's so honest because what I hope people resonate with, well, I don't, I don't, I hope people gain something from this basically, if I can get context for it, because there's so much alienation. We feel so alone sometimes in this path, which is funny because we're all looking for this oneness. But I'd say deep down, I never got, I was never getting someone, they were never getting me. Because as long as we're in identification, and it seems like people are getting each other. I think I look at people and sometimes they used to be in envy that people seem to be able to play this characters, these things. But I think what I realized is there was no fulfillment in that. There's no, there is to an extent, but when it's that celebration of wholeness that like we talked, but I could see more and more that I was never really celebrating this wholeness. I was always, I was never being got, and I felt so alienated in this, in this, in this place. And so to answer your question first from dead on, Awakening, I find, is a lot more ordinary than people think. I think people people have seen a, a, a huge shift in the way they speak to me, the way I am with them, because I think there's 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 a difference in just the energy shift and, and these things. All these things are just words, but the ordinariness of awakening, I think, takes over. And you see, there isn't there wasn't much. The only difference is that I can't. It, it's almost too painful to play a certain character to fit a thing. So this authenticity can come through and the relationships you do form, I find are just through people that resonate people that you don't feel a need to be friends with people in order to get somewhere new and to validate them. And your friendships of a celebration of wholeness that they're, 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 it's really hard to describe. Even the family stuff, you, you, you almost give up hope that these two separate entities will become the perfect relationship or these things you, you just see through all of that. And there's a freedom in that. And then, the expression of joy through through this stuff. But to take it back a step and give context for all of this, there is this big alienation that people really don't get you because when you're not living your truth, when, when you're very mind identified, in fact, I think it's easier to live in the world. It's easier to overlook reality, overlook the truth that you're everything and play the role really well. And they seem to play it and people do play it well. And it can be almost not too much suffering in that. People go their whole lives playing these characters and that can feel alienating because something in you has this calling to go deeper and everyone else seems to not be going deeper. Um, and I remember that's what, for me, if this helps anyone, was so isolating was that I was seeking something and I knew there was a burning desire, but they seem content with, there's nothing wrong about this. There's no higher or lower beings. It's just what resonates and what comes together for the body minds. But they just weren't into the same stuff. And it was really difficult for me to accept that people could just be somewhat content with their body mind and not suffer too much to the extent of the thing and eventually it overtook me that it didn't matter i didn't need these people to understand me or do these things and what seemed to happen as soon as i stopped looking for that in people i've met so many people that are into non-duality and even just authentic people that aren't spirituality but they're so true to themselves or truer than people from before that we speak and there's no need to fill a silence if i'm with them we just we, we enjoy each other's presence or if we do talk it's about art or film or something that cuts through the human condition and can help people or this thing and i think that's the difference it makes is you you start to lose your interest in 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 relationships which aren't resonating deeply with what you've seen in this inward journey yeah when i first started meditating when i was 18 um I had to leave my friends because they were all doing drugs and I just didn't, didn't want to be around that scene anymore. And I, I left a band that I was playing in and I, I just spent a few months walking the dog every morning, you know, and I got into a community college and started doing other things with my life. But oh, of course I, you know, gained new friends and um, that's the way life always is. Most, you know, we're probably not in touch with most of the people that we were friends with in high school now because our lives have gone in different directions. But um, there's an old Bengali saying, which is if, if no one comes on your call, go ahead alone. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's necessary to just um, go ahead alone. And uh, especially if the people who are you're associating with just don't get what you're doing. But like family, um, you know, you can always accommodate and, and be interested in the things that they're interested in when you go to visit them. Like, you know, I have a sister who's not interested in this kind of stuff at all. And when, when she comes to visit, we 
we play card games or you know do fun stuff together um <laughs> which yeah uh and i don't bring up politics because her politics and her husband's politics are at the extreme other end of the spectrum from mine um but we we love each other and we, we enjoy you know so that you, you don't have to we don't always have to wear our spirituality on our chest so to speak and like you say people that do and and take this non-duality and put it through face it as some of us all do at the start i think it's further than truth than you going to your sisters or, or and playing cards that that's closer to truth because to to push non-duality on someone is basically also not trusting the universe yeah but that will come into their life at some point and i remember with my mom i had the similar thing my mom religious but not to the extent of going like really within and seeing through self I remember at one point, I think I did try, you know, we all come across, it's like, mom, look for your sense of self, you don't exist, all these things, and they, they don't know. <laughs> and the spiritual maturity is to see, you know, this isn't this isn't really aligned with what I think. I, I don't need to push it on people anymore because I've seen what I've seen, and if, if it resonates for them and it goes in, then that's great. But right now, all my mom needs is a hug. All my mom needs now is like a someone to talk to. They, in their, on their perspective of life which is not less no more wrong no more this is the end of right and wrong they don't need someone telling them there's no self just like the lady that crossing the street i like if she gets hit by a bus i'm not gonna say well there's no one there she's dead you know there's definitely no one there now <laughs> but it's more <laughs> just like there's just a maturity and a flexibility to the way that reality moves reality doesn't move that rigidly it doesn't stay in non-duality it moves with with something that can accommodate for everything and that i think that's what i've seen as well like like we said there with your sister yeah we speak on the level of the listener there's a an old indian saying that when the mangoes are ripe the branches bend down you know so that people can just easily pick them so um you know the branches don't stay up on high and say nah nah you can't pick me <laughs> yeah yeah exactly Okay, another question came in. This is from Ka Rudolph in Germany. As a tantric practitioner, I have reached a very good level of being and peace. After awakening, an extreme purification occurred, but it seems that there is no creativity and no feeling of purpose. Does this arise in the process of awakening at one time? I can't get myself going for any activity like before awakening. It's definitely a case as well. First of all, I found different body minds are hooked up definitely differently um, in the creative aspect. But I think this seems less of a like, all creativity, what kind of, I, I sense up a flatlining here, a kind of, a, the purpose I think is the more, the thing that can cause a bit more of a confusion because it's as if everything that we were striving for, as I say with the dead ends, they, you get to the dead end, you realize nothing there. So then it's like, there's no man's land of then what? If, if this isn't it, it's even spirituality, even enlightenment isn't it, then what? And this purpose drip, drop, drips and drops away. And this no man's land really is what I would call the best teacher to be silence. Because silent, because there's so many gurus and teachers out there that can give you the techniques, the tantric approaches that I, I just sense this guy was into. All these things are so powerful for, you know, creating the conditions for awakening, even even mindfulness to extend to silent the mind can, can help. But there's a certain level where you do have to start to trust your intuition because again we're, we're going to go into the realm of well i need another practice or to get purpose or this or this i'd really orient towards firstly the subtle sense of self is still there because if you don't have a purpose who doesn't have purpose where, where is this purposeless person this this slight this this entity we refer to it's not all in, in the self because sometimes the, the purpose it, the lack of purpose is almost a reaction to losing what we had before, a kind of grief of this hope in whatever it was we were doing, this creation work, this all these things. And I think the maturity as well comes in, you learn to listen to the silence, first of all, you, you, you bask in that silence, you let it show to you, because when you're lacking purpose, what you're really saying is, I need something more, I need to be working towards something to improve this state that I'm in. And so there's something here in the now that needs to be looked at, not there. So even if it's a residual resistance, the subtle self that's that's going on. This can really be seen in a bit more of a delicate way. Um, slight inquiry sometimes, where is this self? You know, um, the realization that because purpose belongs to a character. If you're identifying with a separate self, you're identifying within purpose, you're identifying someone on a timeline moving somewhere. 
So, so I think what I just want to point to is the subtlety of the later stages of this no man's land. Sometimes, you know, emotional work it can st still be there, but even the that can be let go of. And I think I really love just this, uh, sitting in silence because then what will happen is the mind goes, I need something in order to gain my purpose or get something better. And then we got to do is get used to not knowing, get used to that sweet spot of not needing an answer, not needing to get somewhere an agenda and something unfolds in that unknowing. I would, I would recommend in that, in that no man's land. Yeah. I don't really know the nature of his practice. Um, but I mean, I wonder what he's doing with his time. If he's just sitting and watching television all day or something, um, maybe, you know, if you didn't allow yourself to indulge in something meaningless like that, some purpose would arise, you know, okay, now what can I do that's constructive here? Maybe I should go to school, or maybe I should, you know, do this creative endeavor that I've always thought I wanted to do if I'd had time, or you know, there could be something. Um, because I think that, um, I mean, there are people who are naturally inclined to be monks and recluses, and like you say, sit in a cave, but most of us are not wired that way. And um, I think that there's a, let's see what you have to say about this, but there's there's a, a phrase that goes, Brahman is the charioteer, meaning cosmic intelligence is driving your chariot. And there's, there's a transitionary phase that a lot of us go through where um, we're used to being in the driver's seat. And somehow or other, there's got to be this shift where brahman is the is the driver and it's it can be a little awkward in the transition is like one can lose a sense of purpose one can go with the flow so much that one isn't taking any initiative and is becoming wishy-washy and allowing oneself to be just driven around by uh, by the winds um you know what i mean have you ever gone through anything like that yeah it's it's like that transition phase whereas before it's almost less suffering in the case of I've got a purpose, you're moving towards it. And you see so many people that are striving, you see like the sportsmen usually, and then they, they reach the end of the career and they have to give that up. And there's the grief of losing, losing this purpose, this drive. And I think you sensed in, in, into that. And I would add the most peace I've ever found is giving up purpose, giving up meaning, not even having to somehow practice to then find this more aligned, higher purpose, but a whole different paradigm dimension of prior to purpose because I, i'll go back to it again the, the the meaning belongs to the character the character that doesn't exist the, the character that's moving along this enlightenment history line of going up and up close to enlightenment and now my purpose is going to be there so what i think the character is doing in this moment where he's in these he or she is in the transition phase of not having purpose because the ones that did before have dropped away i feel because he sees through the separate self or the, the meaningless of that meaning, if that makes sense. And now it's like grasping at something else to have purpose. But I find the peace is when I let go of even purpose because like we say, it's, it's a subtle resistance that, that happens. We have a subtle momentum of, um, sorry, it's got a pop up there, but we have a subtle momentum of needing something to, in order to get towards, but you can really orient towards it until you can now sit on a park bench and, you know, of course, career-wise it's all play it's all creativity it's all these things but i could happily stare at I, I don't have this whole weekend stare out at the sea in awe of not needing anything not purpose can be so heavy it's, it's carry around this purpose even i'm going to liberate all beings that's why i don't really like my bio there because at the end of it it said to alleviate suffering for others it sounds harsh i don't i, I will put my videos out there but if people need them but I don't, if I could delete my channel in a second, I could delete everything. It's not, it's not about an income. I'll go work in a coffee shop. The reason I think I get quite a lot of comments, which can sometimes be, I think you even sent me that email earlier today of someone really going through a video. And I think it was like a seven minute video and he gave quite a few paragraphs of what he disagreed with. And that's absolutely fine. But I think sometimes I feel I've hit the nail on the head in, in a way if someone's really triggered by it, because it means if someone feels really strongly by it, Sometimes it means there's something, and I could, I'll always hold my hand up if I'm wrong, and, and I'll look at it and I think, you know, what, what's being said here? But sometimes, and more, and more often than not, if someone's really triggered, it means that the message is quite direct and it's pointing to something they don't want to look at. So if I was to be really direct, I'd say, 
go beyond purpose, go beyond meaning. But if I was to, you know, if you're in a state of absolute depression, like, look, no, there is something to look and you on each level is not wrong. It's just this will help the person more if I tell them, um, you know, go back into the emotion, the feeling of purpose. Can you feel that out fully? And you can kind of compassionately work way. Or if you go all the way, you could just say there's no truth. I mean, there's no self or this thing, but there's a there's a skill to that. I, but I really think the freedom in this is found just prior to meaning, just prior to purpose, beyond the character, I think. Yeah. You mentioned Park Bench earlier in this in this response. And of course, that brings up Eckhart Tolle, who after his awakening, pretty much sat on a park bench for a couple of years. Um, you know, just <laughs> and then I think somebody started talking to him and he started you know, explaining things to this person. And, and he found that this knowledge was kind of flowing through him. And one thing led to the next. And now he's right, written all these books and traveled the world. And, and of course, his purpose is spiritual teacher, and that's not going to be everybody's purpose. But I think maybe sometimes we do need a, a period of hiatus where we, you know, we just put it in neutral for a while. And um, if we've been pushing ourselves in a certain way, okay, let's relax and let everything settle down. And and then, but eventually some kind of momentum is likely to start up again, and maybe we'll go off in a completely different direction than we were going in before. And it's good that you give yourself this little period of rest, uh, but it's not going to last your whole life, or it shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost as if, and I I can, maybe I'm interested to hear your view on this, that the momentum can come back, but without purpose. I think I think the momentum can go in a way that, it unfolds and at any moment you don't know where it's going to take even the purpose if, if it wanted if the teachings wanted to just stop and no one would listen to the channel anymore that's fine as well it's more that it doesn't care about purpose the truth now just moves its own way and for me to put a purpose on something would be giving it an agenda or limiting it to my personal purpose but i've seen so much freedom in allowing this to just take whatever it wants even if yeah. it, even if it kills me this is i think i think this is the this body mind that that's the extent you need to go let let it completely take away with no agenda i think in in what you just said you're associating the word the word purpose with attachment a little bit you know like i i have this mission in life and i'm attached to it uh and i'll be unhappy if i can't do it um, I think there can also be purpose without attachment that, you know, one can be highly motivated and, and dynamic in, in doing a certain thing. Um, but if for some reason that has to stop, then okay. Um, in fact, I, I wish I could find it. It would take me too long to find, but I read this great uh, quote from the Tao Te Ching this morning about um, just um, not being attached, basically, just uh, if if something is taken away or you know you're no longer doing something okay that's over on to the next thing without any remorse or or longing or regret or anything like that just basically living in the now you could say um and what what's wrong to mind when you're talking there was like you say the difference between attachment and purpose i think i always think litmus tests are really good a quick a quick checking in when anything's when you're ever making a apparent decision or these things and it's always you know, am I making this decision on on the behalf of a separate self? Is is this moving from a place of fear? Or am I moving with the whole here? Is this something moving through me? Um, and I even remember, you know, in the post waking phase, even to this day, there's constant clarifying. And it's like, for example, coming here this week. I obviously I live in London, and, and I got the opportunity to visit back home my family, living in the city. Usually, sometimes I go to a certain location to get away from life. You know, these things, and and you think, am I doing this through fear or aversion? But this week, for example, it's so nice to get out of the city and it feels like it, this is just what was right. You know, some decisions, they just, there's no fear there, there's no attachment there. Things just flow without an agenda to suit a separate self. The litmus test is just a constant questioning and inquiring into, am I moving with truth? Am I moving with authenticity? And like you say, let's go meet in the middle. I completely agree. Purpose could be there. Just maybe the purpose of the universe. It's just just non-personal purpose is, is what truth yeah um and there have been all kinds of saints and sages throughout history who have um a, from the outside appeared to have had tremendous purpose they're driven they're they're you know accomplishing great things and, and 
overcoming great obstacles and doing like Mahatma Gandhi, for instance. I mean, you know, he basically overthrew the British and <laughs> and yet he had this sort of simplicity about him and innocence and uh, surrender to the wisdom of God, if you want to call it that. Um, so I guess we just were, what we're doing here perhaps is dispelling the stereotype of an enlightened person as being just the, you know, the guy on the mountaintop, you know, sitting in Lotus, um, a person can be very involved in the world and have all kinds of purposes and responsibilities and so on. And not only is that not incompatible with enlightenment, or if I can use that word, but it's actually in, enhanced by enlightenment or, or an awakened state. It gives gives one greater resources for doing whatever purpose one is called to do. Yeah, and and the key word there is surrender, like you said. Uh, yeah, complete surrender, and uh, bringing back to to, to to what might help people is if you, if you ever get confused about about what to do, where to go, just orient towards just either inquiry or surrender. Those two are, are the sharpest tools you'll have in your non-personal box of spiritual toolbox. It, it, inquiry, like, if you either question a belief or you release resistance, either of those things will, will help. Um, especially, especially, I mean, the belief really, they go to, that goes to the roots. These beliefs that we hold, we carry around. Um, I, I truly think if someone's honest enough and they they allow us to they hold space for this enough you're you're in a constant state of surrender anyway people say you know i can't surrender i i, I can't every time you put your foot on the pavement you're giving faith that your foot your, your leg's not going to buckle every time you step on a bus you don't know if this guy's suicidal he could crash and i don't hope i don't cause any fear here but i'm showing how much you trust life already just trust it inwardly trust trust that that nothing needs to change nothing needs to be done in a way that's by you the only thing needs to be done is something to be looked at or let go of that that's all so i'm just bringing it back to this this like you say you use the word surrender this this marriage between inquiry where you can do something and surrender where you can't do something and in the middle of there is this like magic place where the bottom bottoms out yeah it reminds me of that alcoholics thing you know that thing that grant grant me the wisdom to change the thing I can't can change um accept the things I can't change and the wisdom to know the difference or something I'm sort of slaughtering it but something along those lines yeah that's that, that that's probably exactly the same thing in like just non-spiritual terms in a way even that's very spiritual it is um, well it's, it's a spiritual thing AA is a very spiritual I mean, organization yeah um but um what are we saying here anyway I guess we made that point okay um one thing you were just saying that i found interesting is i mean it, it sounds like in your experience um self-inquiry or discernment or what, whatever you're calling it is an ongoing process it's it's almost like second nature now there's this how, how would you put it it's, it's it's not something you got over with and you know awakening happened i don't need to do that anymore but it's it's kind of the way you roll all the time yeah it, it transforms from i think this is the case in a lot of people it's like it starts off quite clunky especially in the western world we're we are open to raman Maharshi and all of these kind of distorted translated ways we try and work out what is the self-inquiry and there's a lot of great pointers even in the west for self-inquiry we, we ask you know who am i the, the first time to ever look to this person that's even trying to do all these things get happier become enlightened all these things and it's very it, it's quite clunky it's quite intellectual it's like i'm not my name i'm not my face now, what did my face look like before I was born? What, where am I located in the body? You know, all, all of these things, which kind of, we're, we're a very tight ball and, and we're kind of picking away the threads, which kind of unravel the ball slightly. And I'd actually use, let's use the metaphor of a wall. I like poking the bricks out of the wall. Like, oh, I'm, you know, my physicality, I, I can't even locate myself in the body. So that's kind of making the wall of the ego a bit brittle. These are the kind of top ones. And you can do it for every, or every label you've ever been given. I could change my name to Rick Archer and suddenly, and you could change your name to Matt Garrett. And that shows the fragility of all these labels on us. I could shave my head. I could, um, people are changing their gender. There's so much fragility of our, our labels. So we go deeper and deeper to the core. And then it's like kind of non-physical, the thoughts, the subtle self. You know, whenever you have a thought of the future or the past, I remember there's a self in the middle. I, I physically can't have a thought 
without there being a character in the middle, like a Matt Garrett that, or a Rick, like that yours would be like a Rick Clark in the middle doing a podcast tomorrow. And the self-inquiry became so intense and I would say more radical, it was constant inquiry that it went even deeper to the, to the just subject object, just trying to find the subject. Even when I was to see the visual field, I see colors. Okay, does that imply a subject? I, I, I know colors. But does that imply there's a color visual field hitting me, a solid entity there? Couldn't find one. Hearing, it was more transparent. There was no subject in this. Uh, so, so this, I'm just getting to the point where inquiry then, this was still with an agenda though. I, I was doing it with the hope of finding enlightenment. And I only find insights in this when I let go of the agenda. But what inquiry transforms into is you're, you're inquiring out of interest. You're inquiring, of course, when suffering's there is sometimes the best time to inquire. Because this is where, you know, the self really goes and you try and find the self that's really, really suffering and you just can't find it. And it loosens and loosens to the point where, like you say, the seeking's gone. But what, what the momentum of the previous conditionings was, was this momentum of behaving like a self, even though my intellect knew who I was or what I knew I was, was beyond all of that. And this is where I think suffering can become really intense because you know you're not behaving in the right way. You can't blame anyone. You know this is all your own doing to an extent. And... The, the inquiry basically became subtler and subtler. It was, you know, the I am sense. It was the experiencer of these no self um, things. And it just, like I say now, it's endless. Anyone that says there's an end, I am quite suspicious about because it's as if they've achieved something. But to me, you can never clarify this enough. And it, with the balance of not becoming too personal will and getting that revved up, you can always clarify that life becomes so mysterious because the, I know so much less now. I've unlearned things. I know very little. And it's scary to me some, at the start because I was like, this was everything I needed to know. And I let go of the knowledge. And now, even now I'm speaking, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but it resonates. Something resonates beyond the language. And that's where I think I get the best conversation with people is when I don't know what I'm talking about, but something moves through this, this knowing, this, this knowledge that's been let go of. I don't know who I am. I don't know um, all of these things. And it's very difficult sometimes to talk about that. With someone that's into like a particular thing they know a lot about can speak about, but this is the end of knowledge. And because I think you can move into this place of living and not knowing, surrender, it's, it's like you, you then know the truth because you don't, the mind doesn't need to take up all that silence with noise. So, so the, the inquiry, like you say, become deep, just more subtle and subtle and without agenda. And that's how it transforms. Yeah, this thing about, um, you know, you said about somebody who thinks that they've reached the end of it all or something. There was a St. Teresa of Avila said, it appears that the Lord himself is on the journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're coming out with some great quote. I need to look at all these up after. Yeah. Um, did you, um, you know, you have this deep self-inquiry thing going on. Um, did that just sort of happen spontaneously when you were younger it just started happening and then that led you to reading ramana books and other things which gave more of a definition to it or did you start reading these books and get the idea to do the self-inquiry which, which is the cart and which is the horse yes yeah, so this is kind of going more into the personal story which is i think can provide a lot of help with people for the context because i especially remember listening to others thinking Oh, I resonate with that and, I, and I did, nothing I'm doing here is wrong. So maybe I should have talked about this at the start, but it was just actually intense emotional work for a good period of time where like, like I did with inquiry, I, I, I can't not take things to the edge. I like with it, with emotional work, it got to a point where it's actually damaging the journey because I became so attached to the emotional work. Emotional, emotional work meaning like you were actually working with a therapist or just doing it on your own? I had one practice and that was to sit in a silent room or whatever, anywhere you were, just quietly, even in the, the, starting off in, in my house because I needed that retreat and just to allow whatever was in the body to be there without trying to change it, manipulate it, even practice out of it, basically die into it. And this is when I got, I hate creating all this candy for the mind, but I got Kundalini energy, which just bolted up through my spine and just seemed like this, this energy and, and had this like all these crazy revelations which now looking back was good that i never got sidetracked into them because this is where people can set up camp so with all of this emotional work what i realized now was it, it was almost a form of inquiry because these layers of emotion 
were seen to be layers of identity, layers of contraction. They weren't just emotional work and then inquiry. I was doing the tantric approach first for day and night. I remember one time I racked up like 10 hours of just sitting with it. And at that point I knew. So this sitting yeah. and letting whatever happens that, that you call that tantric work. I, I'd call it. Yeah. I think it's tantric. I, this is the thing I don't read about. It. I just, if you do, it was just one practice. Just, I think David Hawkins um, had a, had a, had a single technique of just get as close as you can to wherever it feels this resistance is and just to die into it, let it stay. And what I found was all these little residual, they were like traumas that I pushed down, even lifetimes ago, maybe, but especially in childhood, like they were coming up and these, uh, you know, it was, it was a, an intense period of time and then deep, deep lows and then massive highs and all of this coming up. And one day I was riding my bike and I knew deep down, I think what the, the grief that was coming was that this technique wasn't going to be the truth. I had to let go of the technique and the grief in that, because it is something like dying away. I knew, I just started saying I in my head, I was cycling about, I had a flat tire, so I was really going against it. So there was that, I was, I was fed up. I think that really added to the surrender, but I was going I, I, I. There's something about I, because I remember Ramana Maharshi video and I clicked off it because it probably made me try and look at something I needed to look at. And I was going deeper and deeper into the sense of I. And I sat down under a cathedral and I opened up this video of Ramana Maharshi and I knew every word he was saying, I know it wasn't him saying it, it was like a translation of an English guy just reading out what he'd said, was look for the self or investigate the self and that is all. And I, and I, and I rode home that day and I think, as the mind does, it wants to watch videos. And I was, I remember coming across Rupert Spire that day. I remember coming across all these great teachers that were looking for the eye. And I, and I thought I've never looked around before and looked for the one that's even doing the emotional work. And I, that's, that sparked a good amount of time into just inquiry into the self. And I became so interested in the self. I was suffering a lot, but I think I had this slight, aha, I can go through this. I don't have to go around it with emotional work or, all this stuff and I took that to the edge like you said and that's when we go back to how we just talk about with that even weaning off into um integration that's very interesting um you were just I mean you you referred to past lives a number of times today and uh I you know I, I ascribe to that notion as well I think we reincarnate and you definitely seem to me like one of those people who've been on a spiritual path for many lives and when you came into this one it just sort of kicked in again um you know sp speaking of the Gita again um Arjuna asks Krishna well you know what happens if a person is on the path and he doesn't make it and he dies and um does he not perish like a broken cloud and and Krishna basically just said well no he hangs out in heaven for a while, then he comes back and picks it up where he left off, you know? <laughs> That's, I've spoken to a lot of people and there's, there's nothing really special. Obviously, we're all the same source. It's, it's, it's literally, if, if you sent something, but it, it doesn't correlate with your memory of this body-mind, I've usually associated that with something previous to the body -mind. something like a resonation, that something resonates, but even an, an energetic movement, I think I've sometimes, people, everyone said it, it's not just me, people I've talked about, sometimes you feel something and the feeling is as if it's like impersonal. It doesn't even belong to you. It's like you're feeling that part of humanity. Yeah. So like, yeah. for example, in the masculine, the masculine, we have definitely in, in males, even the Western world, we have certain, we've all got our own little stories of why we suffer, of course, personal thing. But with males, for example, I think there's a lot of um, suffering in generalization, but in like res needing to be an alpha male at times. We're taught with all these things, that kind of... Uh, aspect and with women not to generalize also have some which are they can all relate to and we're all feeling out something that's quite impersonal at times whether it's the lifetime whether it's just this part of the shadow work i'm not sure but i think there's something to really say about you start to realize this suffering doesn't even belong to me it's almost as if like um you're having to go through it for something that's bigger it's not even yours and no, never mind past lives where the body minds don't match up so it, the memories don't make sense but you just energetically feel like, of course, uh, the, the, the apple dropped from the tree for me young. And, and now it's just a, a radical honesty with oneself to, to really feel this through until it permeates all aspects of experience. And you live life just oriented towards truth. Interesting. I was a student of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi for many years. And one time, and he used to speak of all the accumulated stuff in our make in our nervous system and all as stress 
that was the word, English word he used. I think the Sanskrit equivalent would be samskaras. But anyway, someone asked him, well, what would happen if we managed to release or resolve all of our stress and didn't have any anymore? And then he, and he said, then you start working on cosmic stress. <laughs> and uh, meaning, I think, the, you know, the, the stresses of the world, the stresses of society, you become a washing machine for that. And the number of people I've interviewed have said that. They feel like they can feel like they're processing things that are that people are going through all over the world they're they're acting as a purificatory mechanism or something for stuff that's in the collective consciousness yeah i mean try sitting with anyone post awakening and trying not to feel what they're feeling it, yeah you you just feel it and it, there's there's no i'm feeling or you're feeling it. there's just karmic uh, energy that needs to be released that the, there's something in that that's beautiful because then you realize i remember an, an insight quite late on was this isn't even my story this isn't even my suffering my me me, me. this is like the, the universe waking up to itself just in my little corner of the universe if we go back to space and time but it's not even mine it's it's like the universe like you say uh, there's something really resonating here about you lose the per because it's so juicy isn't it all our little stories of this is why I'm suffering. And we all have our own. Many, maybe, unless you've seen a therapist or someone else, not you, but if, if anyone's not seen a therapist, then maybe they've never even talked about them before. But we all have them, our little juicy stories that we like to cling to and say why we suffer. Um, but to resonate, no, to orient towards truth is to really give these up as well. Like, And that that's sometimes so hard because it's so nice, some, comfortable to, and warm to feel why I'm suffering, why I can't, you know, because of this, I can't wake up or because of that. And that's what surrendered to an extent as well. And like you say, you, you bottom out to your to your personal suffering. And now sometimes you just feel like this, this general heartbreak for humanity. You just feel this grief, like we're all losing ourselves. And in losing ourselves, we're gaining, we're going back to source, but to get back to or to, to reveal sources who we truly are requires a tremendous amount of surrender. And now this doesn't even feel like this is my suffering. This is just, I'm feeling this on behalf of humanity here. And it, and it, and it's crushing. It, like it, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Um, we expand our territory of influence. We could say, I think it's a natural human tendency to, to do that. And, uh, and there certainly is a lot of suffering in the world that needs healing. Um, and, you know, I mean, my, I've always had this orientation about spirituality that in a way it's the hope of the world because uh, it, <clears throat> without it, we're never going to sort everything out just with surface level solutions. There, there needs to be a, a change in consciousness really for the world to be changed. And so I, you know, I find great hope in the, the fact that people like yourself and many other people around the world are just having these awakenings and you know you don't see it on the evening news and if you didn't realize that this whole dimension exists it would be easy to become pessimistic um but i i, I know i think that the fact that you know this whole network of people around the world is waking up um could very well be the thing that that saves humanity yeah as you're talking about made me think of the word responsibility and you can look at the word responsibility in your own personal journey of thing and also responsibility for why why are we, why are we doing this and of course if we are to be really brutally honest it usually is fueled by suffering and no matter how of course there's good people out there that will do it in order to make you know, better for someone else but i think the best way you can help others is to really work work on your own realization because when you're for example for me to go into my realization or Angelo to go in his realization, he didn't try and help me. He went into his own realization, flowered his realization, and through his realization, sparked something in me. Or, you know, we don't want to call cause and effect, but it, it was his own. It's when, it's when people wake up themselves that has this ripple effect. Yeah. It's less about this, I'm going to go and help these people. Because once you do that, personal agenda, personal will, all comes back. And it just takes up the room of what reality was trying to do there. Yeah, I mean, look at some of these people that think, okay, we're going to send missionaries to Africa and save these poor heathens, you know, and turn them on to Jesus or whatever. And yet those people themselves haven't had any real genuine spiritual awakening. So, you know, obviously... It's premature. You know, yeah, it's premature. That's, a, that's the word I was looking for. And... uh 
which is the, and there's a flip side to everything. And the, there are people who think, you know, to hell, to hell with you. I'm working on my own realization. So you can just uh, go to hell and, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not interested in you. I, you know, get out of my way. It can become a selfish thing. And I've, I've seen that, but um, again, there's always a balance. Yeah. It's, it's it let me start again. Am I acting from fear? Or am I acting through love? And, and uh, there's something you said there. I really want to go into um, just now. Yeah, just then when you talk about the missionaries, uh, yeah, it's, it's the thing with suffering because I think we project this kind of savior complex sometimes where we want to help these people, but sometimes it's their suffering which is going to wake them up. For us to try and get away from our own thing to go and help these people, not to the extent of the African. Let's say it's someone that's just spiritually suffering, that you know they're your friend or something, and sometimes we can take the savior complex that I need to help them, but. In trying to just do it by forcing something on them, like non-duality or this or that, I think, one, it's an aversion from your own, sitting in your own and, and working in your own self. And if you really were to re realize this deeply, it would flower that what they're going through is exactly needed for them. I've only ever had insights through deep suffering. And there's an extent to, yes, you can help people on a practical level. But sometimes I've found to tell someone to just sit with it. I'm not going to help, but sit with the silence and see what unfolds if, if you don't get help. Like you say, the balance of that. On one hand, yeah, on one hand, we need people to take responsibility for their own awakening. And, and I think that's what I've seen on the brutal side of things. And this isn't to do with the African or the relative level of helping. This is to do with being careful of how much suffering you try and take away from someone. Yeah, there's that. I mean, I, I think that groups like Doctors Without Borders or people that go and you know help people build solar powered wells in villages where the women have to walk 20 miles a day with a bucket on their head and now they can get local water and all that kind of stuff is great and there should be more of it. Um, but um, I think a lot of the times the motivation for going in to sort of quote unquote save the heathens is very egocentric. I mean, there's been so much violence and brutality uh, in the name of that throughout history with all the colonization that happened around the world. And even now, I, th I think a lot of times the, the tendency to want to get everyone to believe what you believe is a symptom of your own doubt and insecurity, you know, um, and you, it somehow helps to you know, reinforce one's self-confidence if you can get everybody else to buy into your particular trip. <laughs> but, you know, there's a case of actually really needing to look within and, and not going and out and trying to impose your beliefs on others. Yeah, there's two words you said there. Um, reinforce, you said reinforce self-confidence, but I would go, like you said, reinforce self. If you're going out with your projections, your need to do something, you're just solidifying the self that's being this hero saving someone. Right. You're running from the truth that you're nothing. Like, because to be able to help someone, you're then creating this self-image of a savior or or someone that can do something, a substance to you that you're going out and doing this thing. And I would completely agree on the, on the relative level of, you know, Africa or people that are in poverty, there's that. But I'm talking purely on the spiritual level or purely on the, on the level of, of mind and suffering and of psychological suffering. Um, if, if I was to think about it, it would be if I could actually make myself believe illusion even more and feel I need to go and help the south of England wake up or London and start a meditation center. These are all great things to do when done with the right purpose, motivation. But I can do that as an aversion to having to sit in silence and sit with what I'm running from. Because as soon as I have these, all these big plans to help London or something, I'm now back into, into mine, back into getting away from, from that. And I've seen just sitting in realization, I've reached people through my YouTube channel where I upload a video, you know, and, and it, it goes whatever and very little effort on, on my part. But the most effort I put in is just tackling that which needs to be seen in the deepest, darkest places of my mind. And it's the worst thing I ever wanted to do to start with. But then you start to realize looking and, and illuminating these dark places in your mind and seeing the self that appears in all these stories. It starts off being the most painful thing, but then you realize it's the most relief because this is where all the suffering was tightly in a ball yeah. and that's what it expands or dissolves yeah i mean recently the pope went to canada to apologize to the indigenous people because you know in the 
last 150 years or so, or when, whatever the time span was, the children were taken away from the par- from the families and put in these Catholic boarding schools, um, you know, and to have the their native culture stripped away from them, you know, shave their heads, force them to speak English, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And then they ended up getting sexually abused and physically abused, and a lot of them died. I mean, so it's a complete disaster where um, people who thought they were righteous were um, just doing tremendous harm. And uh, I guess this is a little bit apart from our general conversation, but I don't know, for some reason it's it's coming up and, um, you know, um, I think that one always has to make it one's first priority to know the self, to purify oneself before trying to help other people. If If you want to be a lifeguard, Learn how to swim before you start trying to save people yeah. from drowning. <laughs> yeah, that's the I think that's the best metaphor for it. Um, and also with the thing with the Pope, it's like this increase in consciousness has allowed. It's almost like there's more awareness now to see what's been hap- happening, and it takes a tremendous amount of you know self honesty to go and apologize. And this is what it comes down to: is honesty, not just with others. Like there's no more blame anymore for anyone else. When you really, this is what's horrible, really, for, because it's so nice to be able to blame certain people and. And even guilt, you know, there's a slight residual resistances and these things. And you do have to be so honest to take full responsibility for your own awakening. But yes, on the relative level, people can harm the body, these things with words. And there's a lot of trauma out there, which, you know, is unfortunate for certain people. But to an extent, for the real psychological roots of suffering, it is all our own doing. But it's all our own play. We've just lost track of who we really are in this big play. And and this is what I'm just all that I'm interested in, all I'm interested in is that root of suffering because people can take it out. And then, you know, we talked about with all these different spiritual stuff, where it's all these branches of spirituality with all, you can trim all day, but it will just grow back if the root's still there. And if you don't take the root out, and even when the root seems to be taken out, there's still this momentum of the root growing back, and you just need to die into that and make it your your life's orientation. Very good. That's a good concluding point. And I know we better wrap it up because you have to leave in about five minutes for some place. Um, so I looked at your website and and there is a, it's a simple website, not a lot on it, but um, you, you do have quite a bit on your YouTube channel and I'll link to both of those from your BatGap page. But on your website, you also have a little thing where a person can have a you know personal conversation with you or something. So I don't know how much time you have for that kind of thing, but um, do you do many of those? Do you you want yeah. people if people want to get in touch they can do that yeah so obviously my full-time job in film so um that's what i do but whenever when anyone ever when anyone is ever interested um i do get quite a lot of those submissions so i just set aside fridays usually for them or the other thursday if people want to talk with me um always open the chat and email as well just just in case you just want to speak so if you want a session yeah for fridays but um my emails through my website is always there if you need to chat okay um, do you take a donation or a fee for that or what? Yeah, so first that session is completely free because I give up a day of working. Uh, yeah, you only have so much time, right? Yeah, so th- there's a fee, but um, obviously full refundable. But I've always found these conversations to be so, on my end as well, I learned so much. <laughs> so yeah. it's great. And um, you meet people, like I said, I've met so many people through it that I resonate with and we kept keep in touch and I, and I absolutely love it. Um, so so yeah fridays i set aside for that great all right well thanks so much matt it's really been great um talking with you and getting to know you and i hope we stay in touch and uh you know see each other in the future maybe even in person someplace if i ever get over to the uk i'll definitely get in touch yeah that's one thing that's one thing i was going to say because i think at some point it will come to america again just because dr mitch i'm doing the moment on consciousness um it'd be so cool to america's a hotbed for everyone i want to interview and stuff yeah, so, um, well, I can help you get in touch with people. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, good. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. And as I mentioned, next week, I'll be interviewing um, Jessica Nathanson. She lives in Israel, although she's from my home state of Connecticut. We used to actually ski at the same ski area, although we never ran into each other, either literally or figuratively. figuratively. But um Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting interview and um, hope you stay tuned for that. Uh, If you'd like to be notified of future interviews, there on the upcoming interviews page, there's a little 
thing on the right hand column where you can click and put it into your calendar and to be notified of the live ones and then the uh, the permanent ones we send a newsletter out uh, email out when i post each one so if you'd like to get that and be notified sign up for the email list there's a place on that gap to do that and subscribe to the youtube channel if you like and anyway if you go to bat gap and explore the menus you'll find a bunch of different things that you might find interesting that <clears throat> i don't have time to tell you about here but just check out the website look at the different menus all right thanks i'll see you for the next one thanks matt cheers thank you all right have a good whatever you're going to do oh well enjoy the rest of your day really nice to speak to you yeah good to speak to you take care bye-bye right.